Are you ready for rapid fire? Oh, I can't. I can't even tell you how ready I am for rapid fire. So we don't have to keep talking about Navy. <laughs> I agree. <sighs> Getting frustrated here. I know. So. A lot of different players, I won't say a lot, but at least a few different players came up, you know, during that Marcus Freeman noon Zoom call today. Here's Marcus Freeman talking about right tackle Emil Wagner. Emil's done a great job. Uh, he's, uh, you know, in his first year starting, he's uh, played well. Um, uh, him, like every other coach and player, has to continue to improve. Uh, but I'm really proud of the way he's performed um, as our right tackle. Uh, he, he works consistently um he's a great team player as you as you mentioned earlier um and he's continuing to improve and so um grateful that we have him on his team and grateful he's our right tackle so vince fill in the blank emil wagner is blank great for this team <laughs> i'll steal his own words uh but no look i think that I think Emil Wagner's been the bright spot on the offensive line thus far. He has not been injured, which is fantastic. And, you know, he he has been the pleasant surprise. I think he was the the quote-unquote weak link going into the season, and he's been the most consistent offensive lineman for them. And so, I don't know. I don't even want to think about where this offensive line would be without Emil Wagner right now. I'm going to go with the most underrated player on the team oh, because we don't talk you. about Emil Wagner. And... You know why we don't talk about a Emil Wagner? It's not because of Fight Club. It's because you don't talk about offensive linemen who are doing their job. And Emil Wagner just goes out there week in and week out for a first-time starter, and all he does is do his job. And more times than not, he is doing it right. Like, it's all the other guys that we're talking about for the most part, and that's why I think Emil Wagner is the most underrated player on the Notre Dame football team this year because he has very quietly just gone out and done a really good, really consistent job at right tackle through the first five games of the season. So underrated is how I would like call it. Mill Wagner. I dig it. Right. Fill in the blank. Marcus Freeman and Riley Leonard were on Notre Dame's in-house wake up the echoes podcast with T Tony Simeone this week. They talked about getting together every Sunday to meet for up to an hour, mostly just to connect. And that is blank. Adorable. <laughs> it's adorable that they like to hang out with each other and connect. That's fantastic. Is that your answer? That's my answer. It's adorable. <laughs> I think it's in, you know, and Marcus Freeman, when I listened to it, he kind of, he kind of touched on it. And I agree. Like when you think about, the head coach and the quarterback, especially at a place like Notre Dame, like these are the two. Yeah. They go hand in hand. 100%. Like, they can identify with each other, I think, more than anyone. And I think that when you've got a head coach that comes from a defensive background, a self proclaimed, not a quarterback guru, you know, I guess he did the same thing with with Sam Hartman. And, and I think it's important, you know, for, mm -hmm. for like the head coach and the quarterback more yep. than any two positions need to have some kind of relationship, you know, like it, it yeah. can't just be, you know, like, well, you know, I'm, I'm a defensive guy, you know, so why should I worry about the quarterback? You know? Uh, so I think it's really, really important that they have some kind of relationship, some kind of bond and they, and they keep some kind of open lines. Of communication like riley was saying that you know eh, shoot you know sometimes it's like we're just buddies in there <laughs> you know what it's like sometimes Mark, you know freeman has he said you know he would like jot down some things like i need to bring this up you know like business type stuff or you know whatever it needs to be um but i think you know again like when when you look at the two guys who get the most credit and the most blame head coach and the quarterback i think it's i think it's important that they have this kind of stuff oh 100 i i obviously i was being i was joking around when i said adorable but it, i mean look they those well, you said the, it was your answer it is my That's answer why. i'm sticking with that answer first okay i'm gonna be very clear about that 
But no, I, I, I think you make a, a really, really good point. And it's something that a lot of people don't understand is that the only two people on the planet that can understand what it's like to be the head coach of the quarterback at Notre Dame are the head coach and the quarterback at Notre Dame. And they, they get all the blame, they get all the love, you know, and that's a lot to handle, especially for a guy like Riley Leonard, who was at Duke last year. I mean, he didn't get this kind of scrutiny when he was at Duke. Yeah. He, he was able to fly under the radar, man. Like, so I, I just, I have no problem with the, with the two of them getting together. And if you want to be a top level program, you've got to be on the same page as your quarterback and your quarterback needs to be on the same page as your head coach. I mean, that, that just is what it is that that's how it works. You know what I mean? And so I think it's, actually, and I think it's important that it's also more than just the film room, you know, hundred like percent. They have an actual connection and can talk with each other. Right. You know? I think it's fantastic. I think yeah. it's great. Um, any issue with the head coach just meeting with the starting quarterback and like none of the other quarterbacks, you know, none of the other players in this fashion. No, I have no issue with that whatsoever because nobody else gets the scrutiny that Riley Leonard gets. You know what I mean? Like he's the quarterback at Notre Dame. He, your team's only going to go as far as your quarterback is going to take you. I have no problem with it whatsoever. And I certainly wouldn't waste my time with the backup quarterbacks. Like you could make an argument for maybe some other <laughs> positions. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. a, a captain of the defense. A captain's or, meeting or something yeah. like and that. And he does or... have captain's meetings, by the way. Like that yeah. is a thing. And they have them weekly and they talk and they do all of those things. But I would not I would not have private meetings with backup quarterbacks or anything like that. Like it's it, this is a Riley Leonard only thing and I'm fine with it. Right. Once you ascend to the top of the rung, then you get you know, you get to have that meeting right. as well. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Know? That's essentially what it comes down to. This is this is not everyone gets a ribbon. And like you said, because of the like Freeman has for the most part, some some background with most of these guys because he is so proactive in recruiting. He's developed like he's already got a relationship with C.J. Carr because he was out there talking with C.J. Carr when they were recruiting C.J. Carr. Excuse me. And most of the other players as well. But because Leonard is a, is a transfer, came from another program, like he's only going to be here for a short amount of time. So I think that's it's important that they continue to kind of forge that. Now, Josh, Josh does not like the podcast. Josh does not like anything external. He would prefer it if Marcus Freeman and Riley Leonard never eat, never go to class, and do nothing but barricade themselves behind the walls of the Goog and crunch film. Stop doing the podcasts, Josh says. Really? Vince D'Addario's answer is what? Vince D'Addario's answer is these guys are human. They're not going to be working on football 24 hours a day. That's my answer. Like, guess what? I'm still a great dad because I do a podcast for 90 minutes a day. Like, you don't have to focus on, I'm also a great dean. I'm all, you know, all of these different hats that you can wear, like that's allowed. And he's allowed to go on a podcast for an hour out of his day wasn't even that like they might have been on that particular like, podcast on, for man. 20 minutes you know come on so give me yeah. a break and they didn't podcast about the meeting somebody asked the question they answered it like that wasn't the basis of the podcast they went on but, the podcast yeah you know again josh is saying if they can meet you don't need to podcast about it this was the host of the podcast simeone asking freeman and leonard about it it wasn't like you know marcus freeman and riley leonard went in and you know, with hey, we meet every Sunday. You know, yeah. we're, we're you know we're let's have a podcast have a about picnic. it. Let's Woo! podcast about it. No, no, they were asked about it. They answered the question. Right, That's what it comes down to. Yeah, come on, everybody. And by the everybody way, calm down. Everybody by the down. way, Josh, when you're getting paid like Marcus Freeman and Riley Leonard are, it's part of the deal. You got to do podcasts. And you got to do media things. I mean, it's it, it part is of it. it's it's That's part of the get, deal. Like getting paid. Like I'm, I, obviously we don't we're not paying attention to what other coaches are doing. I have no idea if like Ryan Day is is doing that. But you know, like the, I don't think they really do the coaches show anymore. Do they? Do they still I, do? Uh, I don't think so, like no. a coaches radio. I don't think they don't do think that. So. And so this kind of takes the place of yeah of what used to be a, a weekly coaches show. Because I know like 
Nick Saban was out there, you know, like sitting in whatever bar they sat in yep. down there in Tuscaloosa once a week doing the traditional coaches call-in show and, and stuff like that. And most coaches are out there doing it and they're getting, you know, they get a paycheck for doing that as well. It's an but, extra, you know, it's, yeah, it's extra income. Yeah. I guarantee you Riley Leonard and Marcus Freeman got paid in some form or fashion to be on this podcast. I'm just saying. So, and the extra 30 minutes or even an hour that they spent on the podcast, traveling to the podcast, whatever the case may be. I'm sorry. That's not going to make a difference in the game on Saturday. One more hour of film, one more hour. No, it's not going to make a difference. You can say whatever you want. That is not going to make a difference there. There is a, right. So like Marcus Freeman needs to shave like, like come two on. more hours. That'd like he needs great. two less hours of home time with his family so that he can be, crunching more film you know like are we gonna are we gonna go that far like riley leonard needs to be making sure that he's not devoting as much time to whatever you know grad program that he's in so he can be crunching film and, and meeting more with mike denbrock you know like they all have they all have different priorities yeah, that they have to attend to other than football throughout the week exactly so. So, Vince, there is a new Super League proposal being formulated for college football called Project Rudy. Its name derives in part from the fact that former Notre Dame Athletic Director Jack Swarbrick is one of the planners of this project. So here's the gist of what they want to do. They would include 70 football programs from the Power Four conferences. The model would preserve the four power conferences, expand the postseason, overhaul scheduling. There would be tiers of revenue distribution, and it also infuses as much as $9 billion of private capital cash into the system. They would eliminate games against group of five and FCS teams, giving them more marquee matchups on the schedule. And they would also consolidate the TV contracts in a similar fashion to the NFL's TV contract, so there is more overall, you know, even revenue distribution compared to what the conferences currently have. So that's kind of the thumbnail of it. There's obviously a whole lot more to it as well. So what do you think about this Project Rudy thing, Vince? Well, first of all, anybody that wants to make the argument that Notre Dame isn't relevant, Project Rudy. Just want to throw that out there. They're literally naming the thing after Notre Dame. Okay. <laughs> right. So that argument is over. Okay. That that argument is absolutely 100% over. Look, I don't necessarily have a huge issue with the idea of it and kind of streamlining things and kind of putting everybody on kind of an equal playing field and 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 streamlining the TV deals. And I like the idea of more marquee games and all of that. I think all of that is actually really good. It's a really good idea. I, I, I do. Here's my biggest problem with the whole thing. And you may or may not agree with me on it. And, that, and that's obviously... No, I want to hear, we do hear what you think. This, this, if they do this, this will strike the death knoll for all the other non-70 teams especially the ones in the group of five be over they're done because their programs are sustained by those paycheck games okay so the mac the you know the american you know all of these conferences who play football they play these big teams and expect to take a loss now sometimes northern illinois beats notre dame right or whatever right but they play those games to get a big check so that they can sustain not only their program, but also other programs on campus. And so you're going to see sports folding across the country that aren't part of that top 70. And I have a problem well, with that. But the top 70 obviously don't care. Oh, I, I, I get it. No, I totally understand that. Yeah. And I if I was one of those top 70 programs, I probably wouldn't care either. You know what I mean? But I'm just thinking about I guess the little guy or whatever, they'll all those programs they are going to fold. There, there's, there's no way the Eastern Michigans and the ball States are, you know, cause those are localish teams, right? Yeah. There's no way they'll be sustained. I, I'm going to give you my it. honest answer to that, Vince. You don't I don't care. care. I know you don't care. <laughs> I get it. I, I mean, they can, they can roll down to FCS if that's what they need to do. I think that they'll exist to some extent. I get what you're saying. They all, you know, depend on paycheck games and all that different kind of stuff. 
I think that compared to what we have now, this is more desirable to me, which is probably why Jack Swarbrick is, you know, involved in this. And, you know, like Andrew was saying, why would schools like Texas, Notre Dame, Ohio State, Georgia, Alabama, and Michigan agree to this equal shares? They drive all the eyes to TV. They should get more money. You know, you're exactly right. And that's why, you know, again, in there, and I think Father David followed it up, there are revenue tiers. So there would be more equal, you know, compared to now where an SEC or a Big Ten school is getting around $100 million per year in their TV revenue, whereas an ACC school is getting, you know, a little north of, you know, what is it, like 30, 35 million or, or whatever it is, it would, it would, you know, equalize things more among these 70 schools, but the schools like Alabama, Notre Dame, you know, that you mentioned, Texas, Ohio State, the schools that do draw more eyes to the TV, you know, they would be getting a greater share of the revenue. You know, again, like there's, there's a ton to this and, you know, just Google Project Rudy and, you know, like if you want to, you know, read through it, there's a, there's a lot to read through in terms of, you know, what they actually want to do. Um, so there would still be that. And that's, I think, part of why some of the, you know, the big players in all this are, are driving for this because they would get, you know, a, yeah. a greater chunk of the revenue. Um but, you, you know, like you would also have to wait, I think it's probably like eight to 10 years for the current TV contract to expire and all that, you know, because you've got all these, you know, different staggered TV contracts and all that kind of stuff. I think it's, I think it's intriguing. Do I think it's actually going to happen? I would have a, a tough time thinking that it's actually going to, but, you know, like if you looked at Notre Dame's schedule this year, like what's everyone's complaining about Notre Dame's schedule this year, you'd have a much you'd have a much more attractive yeah. schedule if all you were playing is is other teams from the power four look i i will play devil's advocate to my own argument i hate it i hate those games that that like yeah. notre dame alabama i hate fcs games i hate those lower level games i don't like them i would much rather have notre dame playing power four teams at all times i really would it makes for more exciting shows to do it makes for more exciting games to watch and analyze and all of those things. So, like, as a fan, I totally understand it. I think my original argument, part of that is is probably from, you know, as a dad talking about a kid who, who is going to be playing at one of those levels. You know what I mean? Um, and, and that potentially going away or looking a lot different. You know, that kind of a thing. But trying to put myself in all the different shoes, right? You know, as, yeah. as a high power five or power four, I kind of like it, right? I just don't like it as the other guys who count on that, those big check, those big checks. If father David says, why bring, why involve private equity? Why can't the conferences do this themselves? I mean, the why involve private equity. I agree with that because I think as someone said, yeah, Andrew said, you know, they can be pretty shady. I mean, there's an infusion of money coming with that, but you know, why can't the conferences do that themselves? I mean, the answer to that is, all the conferences are looking out for themselves. And that's why you've got the system 100%. that you've got right now. And I said this yesterday, even if you did this, like you still have to have someone at the top. There's got to be some kind of commissioner and, you know, someone establishing rules to kind of keep this in place. You know, so you, you, you do have to have some kind of governing body running this whole thing. Yes. And that's, you know, that's why like the conferences themselves will never get it figured out because all they want to do is take care of themselves and just make sure that they're oh, yeah. getting a bigger cut of the pie than anybody else. And to, to make something like this happen, I think you've, you've got to have that infusion of the outside money as well as someone to bring all these people together, yeah. you know, to, I mean, make this happen. The reality is, this is the first step of them breaking away from the NCAA, right? I mean, that's, that's what we've kind of been talking about for five years plus now or more. Like this is the step. This is this is what would would make that happen. They would have a commissioner basically of the seventy, and they would break away. And the new division one, to somebody's point in the chat, the new division one would now be the 
group of five. Like that's the new division one. So they have a chance to win a national championship, I guess. And that would open up, you know, those possibilities and, and all of those things. So, you know, this, they they would break away. It would be over for the NCAA. I'm sure they don't like this idea. No, I'm sure they don't. I'm sure that, you know, again, I think that there's, there are some intriguing aspects to it. I just, right. There have been some other ideas like this before. They haven't worked. I do find it interesting that Jack Swarbrick yeah. is involved with this, especially after retiring just a few months ago, that he's already involved in, I know, right? in, in something hey, like this. Keep your eyes. So, keep, be ready for this. He has a chance of being that very first commissioner. I could see that happening. I could see it as well. That's a hell of a retirement gig. <laughs> yep. Okay, so former, or not former, Notre Dame walk-on and former Mishawaka quarterback Justin Fisher was Notre Dame's scout team player of the week for the Louisville game a couple of weeks ago. It's the second time he got the honor this season. Here's Marcus Freeman talking a little bit about Justin Fisher. Yeah, he's playing some special teams for us. Um, you know, he's been down on a couple kickoffs, done some KOR, and, uh, you know, he's a, a valuable member of our program um to having success and and you know i often want everybody in our program to understand that although your roles might be different the value of you execution executing your role is so crucial for us to reach in our full potential and justin fisher is a great example what he provides for the defense in terms of his effort in terms of his um, execution as a scout team running back but then what he does on game day uh, being a special teams member it's crucial that he gets his job done in practice and in the game for us to have success and so um, he's a great example of of your role doesn't define your value and uh, his value is tremendous for us to have success so what do you think, Vince? Oh, uh, Jay Fish, our old buddy, we used to do the uh, the Mishawaka games, you know, talking about that wing T and the option offense and all that different kind of stuff. What do you think of uh, what Marcus Freeman said there? I think he did exactly what he always does. He initially talks about the person that you asked about, then he goes big picture and he talks about <laughs> that, and then he brings it back to the one that you actually asked about. <laughs> That's uh, right. That was classic. I mean, it's a classic Marcus Freeman answer. I'm starting to see this every time I hear him talk when a question's asked. Which is <laughs> hilarious. Um, but, I mean, he's absolutely right. Look, Justin Fisher has a role on the team, and he does it to perfection. I mean, that's what he does. He's the scout team running back. He's put – I mean, he is he is thick, man. He has put on the, the, the armor, I say in quotes. Like, he's he a has. big, thick kid who can take a pounding. And I didn't realize – I saw uh, – because one of the local news stations did kind of a similar story, and I happened to see it on, on, uh, on X – earlier i didn't realize he's number 46 that runs down on the kickoff team and obviously it's because he wears number 23 and the erlacher kid is also 23 and so i think they're both on the kickoff team and so one of them has to change their number but he's wearing 46 when he runs down on the kickoff team i didn't realize that was jay fish why don't they just make him 46 full time i didn't realize that was him either yeah so yeah I, Unless you, like you said, that one of the TV stations, that's who actually asked the question about him. I think okay. they were working on that feature. But he has played in all five games Good on for special him, teams. I, it couldn't happen to a better kid. Like, the kid works his butt off. He's a great kid, he's, and he's a great yep. kid off the field, too. <clears throat> Had many interactions with him off the field. I mean, he was volunteering to keep the score for, like, a middle school basketball game when he was in high school. Like, he's just a great kid. Um, and so I, it couldn't happen to a better kid, a better family, big fan of the Fishers. So yep, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. Great family is, you know, dad. And, and I think is his mom a teacher as well? <sighs> that I'm not sure. I know dad, dad's a principal. Yeah. But uh, I was going to say like yeah. in education and everything, yeah, and like his probably. older brother, his older brother, CJ, remember he, like when we, you know, first started doing the games, he was yep. playing baseball and basketball and he yep. actually tried to walk on at Mississippi state. Yeah. I don't think he made it. Because uh, he's not quite as big as, right. as Justin. And he was a defensive you know, he, player, yeah. Yeah, good, really good defense. Yeah, he actually, uh, you know, like you're wearing that pen shirt right now. I guess this was before you started doing the games with me. But uh, Fisher Fisher, and uh, Derek Dawson were uh, were part of the final play against Penn. Yep. Mishawaka I beat remember. Penn a few years back for the first time in a long time. I, it, both of his brothers go to Mississippi State, so – well, the I think CJ is done now, but the younger one, Brady, right. I think is down there yes. right now. Yeah, there, yeah, there's some scholarship, and I don't know what it is, but they both, I believe, got it, and they're they, you know, they have a chance to go to Mississippi State for 
minimal, if anything, you know, tuition wise, and, and they've taken advantage of it, what, whatever I dad explained it to me one time. I don't remember exactly what it is, but they found this scholarship and all of a sudden the Fishers are Mississippi state Bulldogs. So it's like, all right, cool. So you don't, they don't think of people around here going to Mississippi state, but Hey, two Fishers did. Yeah. I, it's like, I think they, because they had like certain GPA and yeah, so like, it's one of those, like they, you know, they found out somehow that Mississippi state would yeah, you know, get give you some some really good academic money to yeah. go down there, and yeah. so yeah, they had the grades, and so Mississippi State Bulldogs mm-hmm. all the way for them. And in the meantime, Justin's up here bulking it up, and I, I think he's what's his weight up to? It's like he's over two hundred and thirty pounds now. I know he wasn't two thirty when he was playing quarterback uh, in that option no. offense for Mishawaka, and somehow he's been able to maintain you know his speed too, which is which is really impressive. Two hundred thirty six two two thirty one. Yep. Yep. Fill in the blank. The best postseason in sports is blank. <sighs> this is hard for me. My initial gut reaction was to say baseball, but I tune out of baseball if my team's not in. <laughs> so I'm going to go with the Which NFL. Which is disappointing for like a, a guy who considers himself so such a baseball guy. You're tuning I, out. I'm going. I'm going NFL. I I really enjoy the postseason for the NFL, and I know that's not going to be a popular answer for some people. Because look, the postseason right now for college football stinks. I don't. I'm not a big fan of it. I don't know what the 12 team playoff is going to really be like because we've never experienced it. So if you ask me this question six months from now, I may have a different answer. But right now, it's the NFL playoffs. To me, it's baseball, man. Like, I it, like there, it's it's just it's so. The baseball playoffs are so different from the regular season, but just like with the you know the crowd engagement and the passion, the emotion. And like every pitch means something, you know, and it, it, it's been, you know, you have to have the right announcer. We, we, we were all bagging on Bob Costas the other day and man, it is still, I'm trying to, I'm trying to be patient watching, yeah. watching that, that series, man. But, you know, and even like the TV as well, like, like watching the games on the TV, like you can get upset about some of the in-game interviews and stuff like that. But guess what they don't have during the baseball playoffs on TV that all these other sports have the stupid rules analyst who's going to come oh, on yeah. and like, like over explain every single little play. They've always got to bring the rules analyst in. You don't see the rules analyst in baseball. That's that's clutch. The rules yeah. analyst is annoying. Very annoying. It's just annoying. I don't know how else to describe it. The rules analyst is annoying. Yeah. Fill in, and and baseball is also like it's night to night, you know, like there's nothing like a series yeah. going on and, and all that stuff. And I'm just I'm disappointed, Vince. Yeah, I'm sorry. And it's I been a I don't while. Have, it's I don't been have, a while since the Cubs have been there, listen, too. So I, I don't have the attention span to watch teams for a series that I don't care about. All that's you had my, to do is problem. say I don't have the attention span. Like you could have stopped right there. I don't and... I don't have it. I there's too much going on in my world. I don't have the attention span to sit down and watch games. Vince is tuning out. Fill in the blank. It's blank that speaking of postseason, it's blank that the WNBA went up against NFL games on Sunday with their playoffs, and game one of the WNBA finals is also up against the NFL tonight. That's poor planning. I mean, I, look, I wouldn't put any sport, male or female, up against the NFL because you're going to lose every single time. So that's poor planning. You got to you gotta plan around the NFL. I'm sorry. I know that maybe people don't want to hear that. But if you want people to watch, then you got to you, – you, that's dumb. That's just not – you have the ability to adjust your schedule. And adjust apparently – Apparently, this is an ESPN thing as well. Like, you know, because like ESPN wants the program programming. Because obviously, like with the NFL, the only game on ESPN is Monday Night Football. But like, why would you want to just ensure that no one is going to watch? Don't you want the ratings if you're ESPN in the WNBA? Like, going up against the NFL is just <laughs> suicide is what it is. And it's like, they've got to get this figured out because like the whole Caitlin, like they had a chance, even though Caitlin Clark and, and the fever were out in the first round of the playoffs. So like, they don't factor into this right now. Like 
I don't think it's going to be too long before Caitlin Clark has the fever going deeper into the playoffs, you know, and you want as many eyeballs on that as possible. And it's like as simple as instead of playing on Thursday night, how about you you play on Friday night instead when you don't have the NFL or, you know, like don't play on Sunday, play that game on Monday, but maybe Instead of going up against Monday Night Football, start it at 6.30 or 7 o'clock so that you're more of a lead-in to football. It just it seems like there's some easy solutions. And again, like they've got to get this figured out pretty soon because they've got to be able to, to start capitalizing on Caitlin Clark playoff pushes, basically, because that's, that's what drove the viewership yeah. in her rookie year this year. So good call. All right. Well, I think that's going to do it for tonight, Vince. Like for anyone who says we don't go long enough, I think that uh, I think we answered him. Oh, my wife's not happy. <laughs> uh oh, did I get you in trouble? <laughs> They're at the restaurant waiting for me. All right. Well, hey, I didn't realize that. All good. Hey, I didn't, I didn't bring that. it up because it is what it is. You know. Yep. We have we have things to discuss. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, and Andrew says they obviously don't care about trying to carve out a real audience. And I'll tell you what, you know, again, like as someone, you know, who's who's obviously been involved with with women's basketball, right. you know, in, in different forms for a long time, I've always felt like you're either a women's basketball fan or you're not. There's, you know, there's not many. You don't you don't tend to pull in casual fans, you know, That's like fair. the Super Bowl or the, you know, like That's the NFL fair. playoffs. And those kind of things. But I really do feel like that has started to shift in the last few years. And obviously, this Caitlin Clark phenomenon yeah. Yeah. has completely you know, like, I've got a buddy who I've known for a long time, and we talked, you know, like over the summer, and he has never had like he'll, you know, he'll he actually watches okay, I would say NFL, Major League Baseball and some NBA, but he has never been into women's basketball at all. But like he was watching Caitlin Clark games. And there are a lot of people who are like that, you know, like yeah. because she is so different than everybody else and they've got to get it figured out. Like she Dang. brings, yeah, that's exactly right. Oop, that's exactly right. Josh, she pulls in the casuals four times. Yeah. Like she is, she is the one that has swung a lot of this and they've got to get that figured out going forward. If they want to get, yeah. continue to get eyeballs on that product. Listen, for the record, I love going to Notre Dame women's games. I love it. And they, I'm honestly last five years or so, they've been the better Notre Dame product in the Joyce center. And so I've really, I've enjoyed going to women's games more than going to the men's games. Now, hopefully that, you know, that pendulum swings a little bit here moving forward. But I I love going to the women's games, and what, you know, one of the reasons is my daughters love going, and I love hanging out sure. with them. But I, it's good basketball; it's great basketball to watch. I I really enjoy. It. I can't wait for the season. I'm so excited for the women's season this year. Uh, I I think it's going to be special. Yeah. Giggity giggity says, "How long will that last? As long as Caitlin Clark is playing, I mean, oh, and she's it's up to the WNBA the year. too. Like, yeah." And I mean, you've got some other great, you know, like you mentioned Notre Dame. And I mean, I think we all yep. know it. Like when you've heard the stuff that Neil Ivy has been saying about this team and like just going to practice and the awe that she watches with, with Hannah Hidalgo and Olivia Miles together and everything they're like, you're going to see, you're going to see some showtime this season. Yes. I will tell you that when it's it comes to Notre Dame women's basketball. And there are other great young players like Juju Watkins out there at, at USC and, you know, like, uh, you know, just a, a lot of other great ones. I'm not going to give credit to to UConn players, you know, because let's just be honest. If it's not UConn, they're not going to compliment them. Obviously, right. you know, like I saw Sue Bird is still throwing, you know, like daggers at at Caitlin Clark right now. It's like, come on, man! Like there are other teams, there are other players who comes from come from other programs other than UConn. Can you just give other great players some credit? Like, no, get off it. It's get all off UConn. It. Yeah. All right, we're going to wrap it up with that. I'm going to let Vince go eat with his family. So enjoy the rest of the night. IB Countdown to kickoff will come your way. Uh, we'll have it probably posted somewhere 6.30-ish, hopefully, 
tomorrow night. And then, of course, uh, got uh, the mailbag show that Brian and Trevor will have before that as well. And and uh, the postgame show after Notre Dame Stanford as well. So have a great weekend. Enjoy the game. We will talk to you Monday. IB Nation Sports Talk.